Revolutionary greetings to everyone, in particular the viewers of How TV. Welcome to another installation of the EFF Book Club Review. Thank you so much for tuning in and to come as well to hear what we have to say in relation to the things that we've been reading as the EFF Book Club. The EFF Book Club is an initiative of the EFF Political Education Department to continue and organize ourselves into constant reading and learning in this difficult time of the coronavirus. Uh, we see this as an opportunity to strengthen our knowledge uh, in order to guide our practice in politics. Reading is very central to the practice of politics, particularly a politics that seeks to radically transform the conditions of the poor and the oppressed. A radical and progressive politics and radical and progressive activists across the world, we cannot engage in a politics uh, that is progressive without learning. So learning is important to improve our knowledge, but learning is also important to improve our critical thinking. Comrades who don't learn, activists who don't learn, who don't read, uh, become easily gullible. They become easily gullible. So part of what learning achieves you to do, part of what reading achieves or helps you to do uh, is to resist against gullibility. But also it helps you in a way to be critical, uh, uh, to be able to resist you know, the types of ideas that pose as progressive, but in fact, they are oppressive. We cannot lead our people unless we learn, learn, and learn. So welcome all of you to another installation of the EFF Book Club. What are we going to do today? We're going to be looking at our tools, what we call ideological tools of analysis in order to guide our action ideological tools of analysis. These are tools that we use to analyze society, to analyze the problems. These are the ideas we have used to arrive at the fact that South Africa has many problems that uh, uh, have helped us to diagnose why are there still high levels of unemployment? Why are there still high levels of landlessness? Why are there masses and masses of people in the majority not having access to quality health care, quality education? Why are universities so expensive and inaccessible to poor, talented black kids? Why is there still a problem of racism in South Africa? Ideological tools of analysis are the ideas we use to understand these problems to diagnose them and then find solutions, to critically explain why these problems exist and then also answer the question of how do we solve them? How do we defeat them as it were? So the entire thing is, is tools. These are not dogmas. These are not, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 dogmas, as it were, like religion. These are not religious prescripts, but the tools that we use to analyze society, to guide ourselves into action, and to find solutions to society. In a way, we refer to these tools as Marxism, Leninism, and Fanonism, based on the ideas of Karl Marx, the ideas of Vladimir Lenin, and the ideas of Franz Fanon. And how do we come, or what is it that we come to learn in these things? Through Karl Marx, we come to critique, understand, and analyze as to what capitalism is. And then through Lenin, we come to analyze how to achieve socialism. What is socialism and how to practice socialism today? Not in the future, but today. And through Fanon, in the ideas of Fanon, we come to appreciate what is colonialism, what is a racist society, and how to break out of it, how to decolonize, as it were. So what is capitalism, what is socialism, and what is colonization? 
Karl Marx, Lenin, Fanon. That's like a basic sort of, you know, uh, understanding of what we use or what we are using these thinkers and the ideas that they give us, the things that we are using them to understand is capitalism, uh, you know, and then socialism as well as colonization. How do we understand colonization and how do we break out of it? Within the ideas of these three individuals, or within the writings of these three individuals, remain a wealth of other complex ideas. We don't have time to go through it today, but uh, for the purposes of the discussion today, uh, I'm going to stick, as it were, to these sort of three aspects of life, capitalism, socialism, and colonization, and demonstrate to you how we use the ideas of these people to critically understand these concepts on one hand, but on the other, how to transcend them, how they help us in relation to our program of action, in relation to what the EFF is, what it does every day, and to understand its vision and what it seeks to achieve for South Africa, the continent, and the oppressed peoples of the world. So let us start with Karl Marx. Who is Karl Marx? Karl Marx was a German-born uh, social scientist and philosopher uh, who wrote extensively about capitalism, what was emerging then as an industrial society. Uh, he ended up living most of his life in London, uh, participating in the formation of the Communist League or the Communist Party of the time, participating in organizations that were trying to organize workers and trade unions across Europe, and wrote you know, some of the most important pamphlets that inspired workers as the oppressed, as the people that were being exploited by the bosses and the bourgeoisie. Uh, inspired them to engage in the struggles to attain their own freedoms. So some of these writings include the Communist Manifesto, which he co-authored with his friend and comrade uh, Engels, called Engels, uh, as well as voluminous or three volumes of Das Kapital or Capital, in which he explains what capitalism is, how it works, and tries to, you know, sort of show where it will end, as it were. He was also an ordinary man. He had a family, he had a wife, he had children. But that's basically who Karl Marx is. As I said, I'm not going to spend too much time because, uh, you know, we have to only, you know, limit ourselves, as it were, in this hour. So uh, it is this guy, Karl Marx, out of which we speak about Marxism. We... We talk about Marxism to describe the ideas of Karl Marx. But in the main, Marxism within Karl Marx is actually a philosophical science of understanding society. It's a philosophical science of understanding society. It's not a dogma. It's not a religion. It is a scientific way of understanding society, its development over histories, the development and the workings of society as a whole. So he gives us, as it were, this science which we call materialism. Uh, again, I don't have enough time to get into that, but basically the science, this science of Karl Marx, we call it materialism or a materialist uh, or dialectical materialism as it were. So what does dialectical materialism mean? Uh, uh, briefly, dialectical materialism, number one, means an understanding of society that situates individuals within the social relations in which they live. You don't understand individual problems as problems that, you know, lie in the individual. We explain the things people feel as individuals, the things people experience as individuals. We locate them within the broader mechanisms, the broader social structures of society how people uh, you know are individually shaped depends on the societies in which they live so we, if we understand the mechanisms and the systems of society we are able to understand the individuals we don't understand the individuals then we understand society no 
we locate the individual within society that's how we come to understand society. in order as well to find solutions to these individual problems we have to actually locate you know these individuals in society if we solve the problems of society we are able to resolve many individual problems so in a way at a very basic understanding uh, this is a science of understanding society of explaining how society has developed throughout human history is constantly locating individual actions within the societies in which they live what were their relationship to the means of production how did people organize and live together uh, serves as a perfect mechanism to understand their individual actions and whether their actions do have impact or not. So Karl Marx helps us to understand capitalism. What is capitalism? Everybody goes everywhere. You know, we all go around saying capitalism this, capitalism this. But what exactly is capitalism? Karl Marx teaches us that capitalism is a class society, okay? It is a class society in which people's um, relationship to the means of production. The means of production means the things we use in order uh, to provide for ourselves the things that we consume. So uh, um, the means of production would mean the land, uh, the minerals, uh, uh, the food, uh, agriculture, you know, everything that is there in life that we use in order to find living, in order to live. Our access to the means of production, uh, to the tools of production. Our access to the means of production is mediated by the fact that it is, not, it is owned by few people. So a capitalist society is a society divided into class in which there are those who own the means of production and those who do not own the means of production. These who don't own the means of production, in order for them to live, in order for them to survive, they have to sell their labor. They have to sell their labor to the ones that own the means of production. And these ones who own the means of production then pay them wages. And in paying them wages, they make them work for long hours, but they don't pay them for all those hours. If workers work 12 hours a day, they produce so much in 12 hours. But if you take all the products that they produce in 12 hours, and you think about how much those products actually make in the market, you realize that the wages represent either two hours or three hours. And as a result, the capitalists, or those who own the means of production take the rest of what the workers produce and pay them less. These people who own the means of production, they are called capitalists. They are called the bourgeoisie. They become a class. And by definition, because of this activity, which we call uh, wage labor, this activity of putting people into wage labor. Uh, because of this activity, they are exploitative. They are oppressive. And here, when we say a capitalist, we, we mean like proper owners of the means of production. A big, 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 you know, uh, corporations. We are talking about people who own the mines, people who own telecommunication companies, Vodacom. Uh, people who own big industries like Sasol, people who own big distribution companies, big retail companies like the owners of Pick and Pay, the owners uh, of ShopRite. Not the little owner, you know, of a small spaza shop or a small outlet, as it were, of Pick and Pay. No, the guy who owns the Pick and Pay, Ekaslako, actually pays a lot of money to the bigger owners of the entire food chain, of the entire retail chain of pick and pay. We don't mean the people, you know, who are running a small business and they've got three workers or five workers or eight workers. We mean the big capitalists uh, without which the rest of us cannot survive. 
And then the owners of the banks, the owners of insurance companies, the owners of medical aid companies, the owners of private hospitals, big uh, organizations, big businesses that we depend upon in order to live, that we cannot survive. So if you do not go and work, you are unable to get access to money in order to buy food for yourself, in order to get your kids to go to a proper school in order to get access to good health care. You can't survive unless you get into the system of selling your labor. And when you sell your labor, you get robbed. Uh, you are never paid the real thing. In fact, majority of the workers in the world by big numbers work on contracts where they don't even get basic benefits like medical aid, pension funds, and the, the ability to uh, sort of improve their skills by getting funding in order to go to school. So um, uh, by and large, we are talking about a system that survives on the basis of the reproduction of those who own the means of production who are few, and they then dispossess um, the workers or the big people who need labor. And on this side, as I said, of the people who don't own the means of production, these people we call the proletariat, or Karl Marx calls them the proletariat, or the working class. Working class means anybody who needs to work in order to survive. So you don't necessarily have to be working in order to be a working class. It just means for you, you don't own the means of production. In order for you to have food on your table, you need to find a job. And when you don't have a job, you are unable to survive because you don't own the means of production. So those, all those people who are often landless across the world, number two, uh, they don't own the means of production. They don't own any capital. They struggle to even get anybody with huge capital to listen to them when they've got business ideas. So these are the working class. They need to work in order to survive in relation uh, to the society that we live in. That is what capitalism is. And capitalism is a problem because uh, of, as I explained, it creates a situation in which the rich are constantly few. It is impossible under a capitalist society to have everybody uh, being rich because how you become rich has nothing to do with how brilliant your business idea is. The rich have everything to do with the means, the ownership and the monopolization of the means of production. So the people with brilliant ideas get to be given little capital, but in the, bri in the broader scheme of things, in the broader wealth is reproduced amongst the few people. And so this society is not sustainable because it leaves the majority outside into poverty, uh, into wage labor, into constant cycles of suffering. And as a result, Karl Marx recommends that the working class, because of this contradiction of enriching the few and making the many poor, capitalism is not sustainable. It's not a good system. And it is driven fundamentally by the interest of those who own the means of production to maximize profit. Why do they want development? They want development in order to maximize profit. And this closes the full definition, as it were, of capitalism. Is that all development is driven for the enrichment of these few people through this thing that we call profit. And how do they make this profit? They make this profit by the constant management of the wages. They make sure to extract from the power of the wages of workers, pay them less and take as much as possible for themselves, which is what is called surplus value or profit. So in order for them to maximize profit, they need to constantly pay people less than what they deserve. But in this whole schema, they are motivated and they mobilize the rest of society to be driven by profit maximization. So that is basically what happens. These two classes, largely, they can be 
constantly in a capitalist society other you know forms of relationships to the means of production but by and large uh, a capitalist society is divided into these two antagonistic classes the capitalists who are the owners of the means of production and the proletariat or the working class who survive by selling their labor and therefore Karl Marx is motivating for uh, the working class to unite you know and to realize that they are the real producers that without the capitalist there can be production in society even if capitalists could have all the machines in the world to do the work that the workers are doing they still need workers to consume the products that the machines are going to produce so it's not a very sustainable way of running society so the workers must unite realize that they're the real producers and enter into a struggle to liberate themselves uh, from the bourgeoisie or from the capitalists how do they do that they must struggle to free the means of production out of the few hands into the hands of the many and make sure that they drive these means of production to produce for the people and not for the maximization of selfish interests of profit now we come to lenin lenin was you know a, a, a leader a russian socialist a russian revolutionary who led actually a real working class revolution you know when we say revolution we means a total overthrow of the capitalist society freeing production out of the logic of profit making and making sure that profit is driven for the benefit of society as a whole in particularly the workers who are the real producers so lenin was a russian revolutionary who led in 1917 a russian working class led revolution that inaugurated one of the first sustainable experiments in a socialist practice okay so one of the most important contributions and the reason why we find lenin important as the eff and as revolutionaries who are fighting against capitalism in a capitalist society is because lenin recognized that in order for this industrial supersonic society and civilization to exist it doesn't necessarily need the bourgeoisie most of the people think for industrialization to happen you need you know a uh, private profit driven individuals who own huge amounts of capital and they own them for selfish interest of becoming rich lenin says no we don't necessarily need these people to lead industrial development the workers can take over the state and democratize it and through the state develop their own societies this is the brilliance and the most important you know contribution of lenin in this understanding of capitalist society and how we defeat it so number one, he helps us to understand that in a capitalist society there is a nation's a nation state a nation bourgeois state that the state which means the organized army the police the prisons that in a bourgeois society you know the the courts uh, that all these entities of the state they work in the interest of the bourgeoisie they are there to make sure that the private profiteering of the bourgeoisie is not interrupted the bourgeoisie can make all types of concessions the one concession that they can never make is for you to discontinue private profiteering that makes them continue to become rich as the few on top so a bourgeoisie state or a capitalist state it is a state in which the army the police uh, the courts the laws 
that are governing that society, including its parliament, including the education system, even the religious formations in that society, work to, to guard and protect the domination of profit interests, the domination of a profit system. So, uh, in a way, Lenin says, we have to mobilize the working class uh, to take over these entities and to dismantle the laws of private property, to dismantle the entities of private property, of private profiteering, and use the state, democratize it, but use it to constitute a developmental path in which development is for people as a whole. This experiment is there. Not only um, uh, was it seen in the 1930s in Russia, although the experiment in Russia, you know, sort of failed, but we see it as well in China today. We see it in Cuba, where a state uh, is organized, uh, democratically controlled by the working class, and it leads development, not for the enrichment of the Rupets, not for the enrichment of the Oppenheimers, no, but for the development of society as a whole. So the hospitals that are built by that state are not built for the private interest of individuals. They are built so that they are qualitatively accessible to everybody and anybody who is sick. So Lenin helps us uh, to inaugurate socialism as it were. To define socialism, not in a boring and, uh, uh, you know, in a bastardized way. Many people, when they think socialism, they think, Mawe, we're all going to dress the same, we're going to speak the same, we're going to walk the same, and then there won't be theater, there won't be culture, and there won't be freedom. But most of all, they think socialism is the absence of democracy. No. Socialism, as we've seen uh, you know, particularly articulated in the new economic plan by Lenin, but also as inaugurated from 1978 in uh, China uh, through, uh, you know, the Communist Party of China. It is the um, uh, development of a state that is um, biased to the working class, which leads development. It doesn't wait for the bourgeoisie to develop the productive forces and to lead industrial development. No, the state becomes the leader of that development. And it is a democratic state. It is a state in which its parliament, its councillors, its laws are democratically constituted. The police are held accountable in relation to their action. The military is held accountable through their actions. There are still courts. There are schools. Uh, there are, you know, cultural activities, theaters, and all those things. But these, you know, entities are not for the private enrichment of individuals, but they are for the development of society as a whole through you know, a specifically decided working class bias program. So uh, in a bourgeois society, we depend on the bourgeoisie for industrial development. We depend on the capitalists. That is why there is so much obsession about someone called the investors. They carry capital. They are the ones with a lot of money in the bank. If they don't put that money uh, into the development of factories in the township, there won't be factories in the township. But under a socialist society, we are able to democratically decide that we are going to have these factories where they will be. The state decides those things. It is able to have its own developmental program and doesn't wait on some capitalist to come and invest. Even if there can be somebody with money who comes to invest, such an enterprise, such a company, will not be for the private profiteering. It will be driven for the development of society as a whole. And this socialism is seen as a, a transitory state. It is a transition phase to the ultimate society in which there is no class, where there is no private ownership of the means of production, 
where these means of production are socialized. They are owned and they are driven for the development and the production for all people. So a communist society comes after socialism. And a in a communist society, there's no longer a need for a standing army. There's no longer a need for the police. There's no longer a need for the prisons. Because the problems of society that needs armies, that needs prisons, that needs police, is a society in which, uh, you know, majority of its people don't have access to the means of production, hence crime. But also a society in which there is no threat from anywhere else uh, by the bourgeoisie, maybe who go to exile, start organizing themselves and coming to sort of make a destruction and try to bring back a capitalist society. That's what the significance of that army is under socialism. So it is through learning that we come to appreciate that a state that is democratic, that is accountable to the working class, can be used to drive development, in particular industrial development. So um, we don't need to organize our society the way the Americans do, the way the Europeans do. We can organize our society the way the Chinese people do, but become better than them, become more democratic, and you know all the entities of the state become accountable. So we do not, we do not get out the most important, um, you know, progressive. Uh, 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 any any progressive development that is going to be in the interest of the people has to be democratic. It has to be democratic. So the democratic control of the state, elections are still there. There is accountability, particularly to make sure that there is no corruption, particularly to make sure that there is no nepotism, that those who are inside the administration uh, do not start hiring their girlfriends, hiring their relatives. Uh, in order for that not to happen, we need democracy. We need open, accountable, and corrupt-free government, as the EFF always says. But such a government can get involved in the development of the economy. So at the moment, people say, no, the government must not get involved uh, in running companies. The government must not get involved in running uh, uh, industrial development because governments can't do that. But the reality is, even in America, even in Europe, some of the most important industries were owned by the government, were initiated by the government, were developed by the government before they became privatized. So uh, the, 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 one of the most celebrated things in, you, in, in, in Britain, for an example, is the railway. Uh, you know, the entire railway system at some point was was ran the company the company was state owned it is the state that developed you know uh, the railways of britain it is the government so it's not that the government is not uh, uh, capable of doing so corrupt individuals are everywhere there are corrupt people in banks there are corrupt people in private companies you know in private companies you've got bokuos who are able to leave school with a metric and can be a manager over accountants, over engineers, simply because that company belongs to their uncle. You've got a founder Merve who can leave. Sometimes they're even a dropout. They can come work in your company uh, without the proper qualifications because that company be belongs to their relative. Those things still exist. But in a democratic state, we are able through democratic accountability to hold each other accountable openly to make sure that um, the, the jobs are done by qualified people who go through a process uh, that, is, that is meritocratic, that looks at merit, that looks at qualifications and doesn't look who is your surname. Oh, you are Zoma, you are, you are Duduzani. Suddenly, hey, Duduzani has got access to the Guptas. Uh, he's now this businessman. Uh, because he's because of his father, he's this businessman. You know how many young black people who have had brilliant ideas of business they can't get any investment. But Duduzani, who does not have 
any brilliant new product that he has invented. He's everywhere. He's got businesses. He's got this and that money. Why? Because of his connection and the position of his father in the political system. That is the case as well with a lot of these white people. That is the case as well with a lot of children of the chiefs, children of the kings, uh, you know, royal families. They are not better than anyone else. They've just got access, as it were, uh, and proximity to people who are powerful, who've got uh, control at a specific moment to this and that administration. So uh, in a society that is democratic, we are able to break those nepotistic lines of relations and judge people on the basis of the brilliance of their ideas. That a, ch a child of a domestic worker, if they got, they've got a brilliant idea uh, in a society like that, they are able to find their way uh, you know, into being at a specific company and calling the shots, as it were, because of the brilliance of their ideas, because of their hard work, not because of the sinning that they bear. So that, in a way, is what Lenin helps us to, to, to sort of appreciate that, no, we don't have to depend on the markets. We don't have to rely on some bourgeoisie. The workers, through the power of the state, which is centrally organized, democratically held accountable, is able to lead industrial development. Okay. There's a whole lot as well, as I said, that we find a whole set of other important contributions that we find inside Lenin. For an example, you know, how do we, you know, form organizations in principles like democratic centralism, principles uh, that you know, we practice when we do organization that, uh, you know, we, you've got the right to debate, but once the majority has taken a decision, the decisions of the majority are binding uh, on the minority or those. If you held a different view, once we have taken a decision, we go and act, your disagreement dwindles into insignificance. This helps us to have a progressive movement uh, in the ways in which we practice uh, organization in the ways in which we organize organizations of the working class as we struggle for the crushing of the bourgeois oppressive state and the development of a new democratic worker control state that will lead development. And then Fanon. Franz Fanon uh, was born in the Caribbean islands of Martinique which was French occupied or which was under French colonization. He's an African uh, who ended up uh, in Algeria, contributing into Al to the Algerian uh, War of Independence. Um, and uh, Franz Fanon was uh, as well an educated psychiatrist, attained his PhD in psychiatry. Uh, he was a revolutionary as well, as I've already explained, who participated greatly in the many theatres of independence in the African continent. Uh, and died of leukemia uh, 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 in 1960. Um, and so through Fanon, Fanon writes extensively about colonization. These are, this is an idea or a concept uh, which is not properly articulated in many of the thinkers of the West, particularly, uh, you know, who are thinking about capitalism and so on and so forth. So with Fanon, we come to appreciate what is colonization. That colonization was a violent process of organizing society in which the natives were created as subhumans in the service of white people who were thought of as human beings. Colonization is the organization of society on the basis of racism, but in which this racism took a specific form in the African continent, where African people were oppressed on the basis of the color of their skin, treated as subhumans, culturally reproduced as subhuman. And Fanon helps us to understand that this violent process, of course, starts in the first instance, through colonial conquest, land dispossession. But the 
design of a society in which the everyday experience of black people is that no matter what they do, they are discriminated on the basis of the color of their skin. It doesn't matter how smart they are. It doesn't matter how good English they speak. It doesn't matter how much they get out of black culture and they adopt European culture. They are never recognized as equal human beings by white people or Europeans. Fanon helps us to appreciate that in a colonial society, uh, this violent production of black people as subhuman beings creates inferiority complex in them, creates a condition in which they feel inferior. As a result, they hate themselves. This hatred is expressed in different ways. They want to escape the blackness of their bodies. You know, they want to be white. They start wanting to look like white people. They start wanting to make themselves look white. But it goes beyond the basic looks. It goes to culture. They adopt, they try so much, you know, to speak the European languages. Because in a colonial society, nothing else matters than the things that white people make matter. So because of inferiority complex, they look down on their religion. They demonize their religion. They look down on their own history. They demonize their history. And they are even afraid that if they were to be left alone in the continent without white people, things would fall apart. They develop inferiority complex. And this inferiority complex even, even results into a form of self-hate in which they hate each other as well as African people. So, and Fanon makes it a point for us to appreciate this inferiority complex that makes us want to embrace, you know, a th things that we are not. Makes us infatuated, obsessed with the wide ways of doing things. He says that we must appreciate that we feel this way. It's not our fault. We feel this way because... We have been produced by the colonial society not to want to be ourselves, to always want everything that is approved by white people, everything that is celebrated by white people, everything that, uh, you know, white people say is right. That is what is right. This condition about black people is created by colonization. That even after... African countries have gained independence. Even after white people have given you your own freedom, you still want to be like them. You still want to please them. You still want to do everything in the ways that make them clap hands for you. And he says that this is the sickness of having been colonized, of having been oppressed on the basis of the color of your skin. This specific form of oppression is not found in other societies. It is the humiliation that African people have felt, have experienced under colonization. And all African people across the world are viewed in this way. That blackness represents evil. It represents incompetence. It represents no ability for self-control. It also represents, you know, over-sexualization as it were. And in order for a true decolonization to happen, in order for us to break out of colonization, Fanon encourages us to be aware of this inferiority complex that makes, you know, even in post-colonial societies, people to want the approval of white people. That true decolonization has to crush whiteness. Whoever wants to be white in the world can only be white by having black people. So, all white people are racist. And anybody who wants a world that is truly equal must want the elimination of whiteness, the elimination of a white identity, the complete crushing of white identity. Because whoever wants to be white means they want others to be black. No white person says, no, to be white just means, you know, uh, us who come from Europe. No. Then you can call yourself European. But you only say you are white because you, aren't, you want other people to be black. So, 
Fanon helps us to appreciate this racism, helps us to, uh, to understand that a true decolonizing world, a true decolonization is the crushing not only of a colonial state, but the complete elimination, the complete crushing of the conditions that make whiteness to be there. What are these conditions that make whiteness to be there? It is, as we see, uh, you know, the refusal for the expropriation of land and the constant justification, as it were, that no, uh, if, we dis if we expropriate land and distribute it equally, we're going to disrupt society, people, there won't be food, uh, you know, there must be a gradual, you know, development and there must be a gradual taking out and allocation of the land. Why? Because, oh, black people owning the land, there'll be too much disruption. That is the most racist, self-hating view. Because when white people took over, they didn't take our land gradually. They conquered us and they took the land and they experimented with it for over 300 years to get where they are. That is how confident they were. So a true decolonization must crush the conditions that make white supremacy, that make whiteness to thrive, which is the constant ownership of the means of production, the constant concentration of wealth in white hands. Fanon says true decolonization must recognize that the African world, that the African continent was not just, you know, industrialized, that that industrialization happened in the ways that made others black and made others white. And that these whiteness or that this whiteness, these white people were made to be the ones that own the means of production, the ones that reproduce good life, that make, uh, as it were, access to health care, access to good education, a matter of whiteness, a matter of the color of the skin, that those who were not white could not get access to these things because they were black. So you couldn't say that you are decolonizing and you do not transform the conditions that make colonization in the first place to be there. What are these conditions have indicated is the land. And Fanon is very specific that you, you will never say you are decolonizing until the land is returned into the hands of the majority. He actually explains that this access to the land signifies the very dignity of black people. That there is no uh, decolonization, there's no overcoming of racism without access to the land. But in the land are the minerals. In the land are all the resources that are needed to humanize ourselves. Because colonization created a compartmentalized world where black people were pressed into spaceless zones of non-being, into spaceless zones of death. Townships, spacelessness. There are no basic services. People die there. You can even be killed with impunity. It does not matter. You are trapped there. And the army, the police are there to ensure that you stick and stay there and never disrupt white towns or settler towns, which are towns that are developed where there are basic services, there is access to quality health care, access to education, and so on and so forth. To crush this compartmentalization, Fanon says we must be prepared to unleash all forms of violence. We must be prepared to die for our freedom. So as a result, the crushing of white supremacy, the crushing of colonization requires a preparedness of the fight to the death. Unless we return those things, we remain in a condition of blackness. We remain in a condition of subserviency. We remain in a condition of subhumanness, of animality, of being treated like animals, of being treated like non-human beings, like perpetual children who don't know how to run their own affairs. That every time, everything that we have to do, it must be done under white supervision that it is not good unless it's got white affirmation. 
Fanon helps us to appreciate these things, to appreciate that indeed we are black, and to begin to appreciate that to be black is not evil, it is not bad, to, to begin to appreciate not to escape our bodies, not to demonize our history, not to demonize our culture, to take over and with the utmost confidence and make an unequivocal, unapologetic struggle, engage in an unapologetic struggle for the total emancipation outside this condition of blackness. So, having said these things, that's Karl Marx or Marxism, Leninism and Fanonianism, I just want to conclude by a basic description of the South African society. How do these concepts, how do these ideas help us to understand South Africa? And how do we change this South Africa? Number one, we're able to, through these tools of Marx, Lenin and Fanon, to demonstrate South, that South Africa is a neo-colonial capitalist state. A neo-colonial capitalist state. Meaning, it is a capitalist state that sustains white people as a privileged race over black people. Even the democratic transition of 1994, it was all meaning. It was, you know, the, 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 the negotiators of 1994, we don't falter them. They were well-meaning, they had good intentions. But unfortunately, you cannot negotiate with racism. You cannot negotiate with colonialists. Fanon told us a long time ago, you don't negotiate with colonization. If you negotiate with colonization, the colonizer is going to remind you tomorrow that she or he is the one that gave you your freedom. They are going to dictate the pace of your freedom. They are going to tell you, oh, take the land firstly in 10% in 30 years and then take it in 5% in 40 years, you know, so that you don't disrupt you know, society. What they really mean is that so that you don't disrupt the situation in which they always are privileged as white people. So South Africa is a state that democratically advances white supremacy at the expense of black people. That is what South African society is for us. And we're able to analyze it this way because of our adherence to Karl Marx, Lenin, and Fanon. What do we seek to do? What is it that we are engaged in when we say we are engaged in the economic emancipation struggle, in the economic emancipation freedom? We are looking for the total decolonization of South Africa and the establishment of a democratic socialist state for the development of all people, regardless of their race. Meaning, when the EFF government takes over, it has to make sure that the constitution is explicitly, it has to make sure that all the institutions, all the laws are freed of colonization, are freed of every element that makes white supremacy thrive. We have to free society of the mechanisms of creating white people's only institutions. We have to make sure that we crush the conditions and the ability for the perpetuation of white supremacy of separate white development, of separation of white people as a people that must always be on their own, develop on their own, be rich on their own, be the only ones who've got access to quality things. We have to free all the resources to make sure that they benefit all of us. And unapolog unapologetically make that development specifically free the oppressed. And who are these oppressed? The oppressed are the black people. So we engage in this struggle with that commitment for the total economic emancipation, appreciating that there was colonization in South Africa, number one. Number two, that 1994 and democracy did not crush colonization and that capitalism is not good 
Even if cap that capitalism can be without a race, capitalism is not good. It always results into massive inequalities where people, where majority of the people don't have access to the means of subsistence, don't have access to the means to make themselves live. Therefore, our struggle is a decolonization for the establishment of a socialist democratic state for the development of society on the basis of people and not profit. This is possible. This is our struggle. This is what we invite the people of South Africa to participate in. This is what every day when we wake up as fighters, as revolutionaries, we fight to achieve here in South Africa. I just want to say the last final things. Number one, such a struggle has to be internationalist. One of the most important, uh, uh, one of the most important commitments or most important uh, principles in this struggle is a commitment that uh, such a socialist democratic state cannot survive without the democratic socialist emergence of the whole world. So. The workers here in South Africa have to have solidarity with the workers in Zimbabwe, have to have solidarity with the workers in China, have to be in solidarity with the workers in Italy, the workers in, uh, in Brazil, and so on and so forth. We have to see that this system must emerge, not just in South Africa, but across the world. The development of South African workers is impossible without the development of the rest of the workers of the world. The other important aspect is Pan-Africanism. The total commitment to the liberation of Africans across the world. Your total commitment of fighting racism everywhere it rears its ugly head in the world. The appreciation that African people all over the world are discriminated against on the basis of the color of their skin whether they're in China, whether they're in Japan, whether they're in America, whether they are Americans. Beyonce is as a kafir as me. It doesn't matter how much rich she becomes. It doesn't matter that Kanye West today is a billionaire. In the eyes of white people, he remains a black person. He remains a subhuman. And one day they are able to demonstrate that. So it's to understand the Pan-Africanist solidarity means that we recognize that anti-black racism exists across the world and it finds its origin in the colonial encounter in the continent which resulted into the transatlantic slavery on one hand. So that slavery movement that resulted in a lot of Africans being there in the Caribbean, in Latin, as well as in North America, as well as in Europe that all the Africans were distributed across the world through a violent colonial system of slavery because of the color of their skin. And that countless laws and systems have always oppressed them on the basis of the color of their skin. So a pan-Africanist perspective also understands that on one hand, but on the other is a commitment to the continent to appreciate that the development of the continent cannot happen if you are just committed to South Africa alone. It services the interest of the imperialist, racist superpowers for you to constantly think of yourself as different to a Zimbabwe, as different to a Nigerian. The division of Nigerians and South Africans only benefits white supremacy because the greatest threat to white supremacy, the greatest threat to racism is the unity of Africans. In fact, we benefit more if we were to develop the continent as a whole. Then there will never be refugees. Then there will never be a xenophobia because nobody will be running from their country because there is no development. So a pan-Africanist commitment is to recognize that we are all affected by a colonial system and therefore our destiny is the same that we've got one destiny which is the development and the freedom of all african people to live in peace and harmony together and not only 
as African people, but also together with the peoples of the world. These are the important principles in the struggle for economic emancipation. So, to all South Africans and everybody that has been listening over the last hour, I've been presenting as part of the EFF Book Club Ideological Tools of Analysis, in which we look at Karl Marx and his ideas, Vladimir Lenin and his ideas, Franz Fanon and his ideas. And out of their ideas, we come to appreciate what is capitalism, what is socialism, what is colonization, and how to conduct a struggle against capitalist exploitation, against colonial exploitation, to give birth to a democratic socialist, non-racial society. And I'm just saying non-racial there. There's no non-racial now. Only a socialist uh, uh, decolonization of society can give birth to non-racialism. But at the moment, we have to have an unapologetic commitment to the freedom of African people from racism or from colonization. This struggle must be joined by all of us. Whoever you are everywhere, this as a concluding piece, as a parting piece, is an invitation to join the struggle for the total economic emancipation of African people for the development and the industrialization without capitalist exploitation that is possible through a socialist democratic state. It's possible to build a world in which Africans are treated as true human beings and they enjoy peace, they enjoy prosperity without racial discrimination. And such a project cannot happen in isolation here in South Africa. It has to take the continent as a whole on board. So economic freedom must start here at the bottom of the continent, spread across the continent. The commitment has to be real and it has to be in the struggle. So that is our message. That is what the ideological tools of analysis bring us to. Thank you so much for watching and remember always, learn, learn, learn. There is no conducting a revolution without learning. Without us committing ourselves to reading and learning, we become gullible and we can be misled by any Tom, Dick and Harry that speaks expensive English. If we apply ourselves to learning and reading, no matter how hard and isolationist reading can be, the outcome is beautiful. It's knowledge and the ability to engage in informed action, not ignorant action. Thank you so much. Hasta la victoria siempre. Amanda.